Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. One of the biggest shows on Broadway right now is not a musical involving wizards or sponges. Well, those are big, too. But it's St. Joan, starring our next guest, Condola Rashad, as Joan and John Glover and Patrick Page. It's George Bernard Shaw's impeccably written satire, adventure, tragedy about Joan of Arc's rise from field peasant to heroic general to martyr. Let's take a look at a clip. Please welcome John Glover, Patrick Page, and Joan herself, Condola Rashad. Hello. Hey. <laughs> um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I want to talk everything about the play. I loved the play. I loved all okay. the work that you did. Did you just did you just As slam I yourself? Hit myself in the face with the <laughs> microphone. It's a great way to start this interview. You know, with mics, you want to hold them right around here. You know, talk. <laughs> you can project a little bit. I know on the stage, you know, they don't have mics for the show, so. Um, First off, I love your dress. Thank you. It's so beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, St. Joan, it's a really beautiful performance. All of you guys are so great in it. But I think uh, what you deliver is so interesting because so often I think this role would be performed with a certain amount of intensity and hysteric hystericalness. Is that a correct word? Excuse me. Whereas yours is she's, she's smart. She's on top of everything. And she's also quite funny at mm -hmm. times. She's a formidable opponent for every man that she's being stacked up against. So yeah. can you talk about sort of developing this idea for the character or was that all really in, in Shaw's script? Well, I found that that was reflected in the play itself. I did find that. Um, also, uh, part of my development for that character was based on the research that I did on Joan herself. Um, and so I didn't just kind of make decisions because I felt like it, it, was, it really was based on what I learned about her. Um, both, because I, I think a lot of people don't realize that we have her own words, like, you know, all of the, um, the transcripts from the trial are there. So we have her own quotes. We have what she said happened. She speaks about herself. You can see what she said about herself. But also um, through the trial of condemnation and then also the trial of rehabilitation, which happened after she was killed, um, there are so many testimonies as to what she was like. And so I based mm, the character based on what I uh, gathered from that, um, which was that when she was leading the troops, when she was speaking about her purpose, there was a level of fire that was there. And it was so captivating. And everybody that, that was around her, even people on the opposite side, said that there was they couldn't describe the feeling that they had when they were around her because she was so full of this energy. And also what they said was people that were close to her would say that you know when she wasn't speaking about her purpose or she wasn't leading the troops, she was actually quite quiet and simple. She didn't speak very much. So to me, I found that interesting that this is not a play just about her personality. This is a play about what her purpose was. In fact, her personality was multifaceted, and it wasn't it wasn't just General Joan all the time. You know, she was a, she was seventeen in our play, seventeen, and then also nineteen. But she's a she's a she's a whole human being. Right. Whereas before, we only really got one dimension of yeah. her, whether it was prior to the sort of re the the trial that came after and made her a bit more of a martyr rather than right. that was crazy it was either this side or that side exactly. and not a whole person exactly and so yeah. i was more i was more focused and i thought it was more fascinating to really tell the story of the person I think one of the great things about the men of the play when matched up against Joan, they're not necessarily oafish, but they have such an intense belief in themselves as competent people that oftentimes it can overshadow what they could notice in Joan and what they could notice is happening in this entire story. Can, was that something that you felt in the, in the play as well? Yeah, I'm like a number of people in the play, I play two characters. And I think what you're saying is really true about one of my characters, the Inquisitor, which is, who is the person who comes in to try Joan and decide whether or not she's a heretic. Um, and in that case, I think he has the certainty of 
the church behind him. He has uh, certain rules that he has to follow, and if he simply follows those rules and doesn't uh, doesn't go off his path, um, he can do no wrong. And that's great comfort to know that if I simply follow the rules, I think that's a real. That's one of the things that threatens people so much about Joan. Is she saying no? I'm the rule. I, I can't follow the rules because the rules are wrong. I'll follow the rules as far as the rules are right, but when the rules are wrong, I have to listen to my own conscience. And that's what's so unbelievably threatening to people who don't have the courage to do that. And so in a way, the Inquisitor is a person who stands for that kind of rule of order by the book. Don't get his emotions involved, simply do his job. But the other character I play is Robert de Baudricourt at the beginning, who is the person who first gives her a horse and armor and sets her on her way. A really fun performance at the top. Both your performances are great, but that, that character at the top is very fun. Thank you. I love playing him, and one of the reasons I love playing him is he's actually kind of... Uh, the opposite of what you described. He's very unsure of himself. His castle has been taken by the French. Um, the country's being overrun by the French. He sees the British army, or rather the English army, as um, unstoppable. Um, he asks Joan, have you ever seen these English fighters? They're not like our French fighters. They're much, much better. Um, and so he's, And so his sense of certainty is uh, a bravado, it's a mask yes. that she can puncture fairly easily. Whereas with the Inquisitor, there is, I don't think there is a mask. And I think that's really interesting writing on Shaw's part and interesting casting on Dan Sullivan's part to give me those two opportunities. And I think with the Inquisitor as well, he is a, he is a man that is battling his own individual emotions about this entire thing that he's going through. And so much of this could have been a kind of easy takedown of bureaucracy and the church at the time, but it's not, I think, because so many of the people that are operating within the church that we're watching are struggling with the decisions that they're coming to and having to operate under the sole thumb of the, the sort of church's bureaucracy at that moment. Yeah, Shaw famously wrote in his preface for this that there are no villains in the play. And um, the Inquisitor is not wrong when he says, if we let people like this uh, simply pass, uh, the church is, is done for. As long as, if, if we are no longer the arbiter between God and man, and if they don't have to follow the rules of the church, then the church will cease to exist. And he, he's not wrong about that, and his fear about it is well-placed. Um, and so, again, he's, he's doing his job. He's telling the truth. Someone asked me about villains the other day because I play a lot of them. And uh, I, I you said... don't say. Yeah. That voice. Hmm. <laughs> and uh, he, he does, too. And, um, and one of the things I said is one of my criteria is do they lie or not? I think villains lie a lot. You know, Satan is said to be the father of lies. The Inquisitor never lies. He tells the truth. He's doing his job. Now, then, if we have you know, the uh, Nuremberg trials for Joan, the, the Inquisitor would go down because just following the rules can be wrong as well. But John, you play the Archbishop who is... Um I don't, I don't really want to give my description of him. I did that for the last two characters. But he's another man who's operating with one layer in front and then what's actually happening to him emotionally behind that and how he may really feel about those things. But he's, his a, he's a new free thinker. But I got to say that Condola's Joan, I've, I have seen several Joans, and I've been in another Joan, but her belief is so strong, stronger than any close years that I've ever heard, seen or heard. But so, and, and with all these men, of course, because it is so strong, they see it as the kind, this kind of arrogance that is, mm -hmm. that is so disgusting sometimes to them. Not to me, though. I understand her. <laughs> I'm the one person. <laughs> no, no. Anyway, but I saw the uh, Ruth uh, Bader Ginsburg movie yesterday, and, uh, and it, it reminded me so much of what... Uh, Condola is doing with because her belief is so strong too. She just happens to be a lawyer, so she's shrewder than Joan is. There's a kind of innocence to Joan that, had she sort of been cleverer, she could have sort of wowed them. But 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 that's what her performance is so exciting because it's just. I mean, she's so damn sure of herself, and she turns kind of. I mean, it's just. It's, it's like a little guy that's just, and that's insulting to all these men around her. It's an amazing play. 
and great. even more amazing here. I think it's an amazing play, and it's an, an incredible performance for which you've received your fourth Tony nomination, right? Congratulations. Thank you. Um, the girl can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the... The, the 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 inquisition scene the you know the scene where your character Joan is really kind of her mind is changing consistently and she's going sort of from one side and being convinced to do another thing and finding another part of herself and belief in herself I can't imagine how hard it is for uh, uh, an actor to pull off that scene every night and to wrap your head around all of those in changes and objectives that your character goes through. Can you talk about working on that? Yeah, um, the trial scene in trial particular, scene, oh no, it, 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 we, that was a real hefty <laughs> scene that we uh, took on and I remember when we were in, re something about rehearse, our rehearsals it was kind of this um, marathon training, so that once we got into performances, not that it's not challenging, but rehearsals was really challenging because, I should say rehearsals were really challenging because we would do the trial scene and then we would do it again. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so like instead of just like leading up to it, doing it and moving forward, we would start there, continue there, do three lines of it, stop, talk about the three lines, do two more lines, talk about, you know, so it was, because we really had to find the temperature of it because it's actually such a long scene. And as yeah. you said, so many things happen in that scene. Well, your character is going from complete belief and faith in herself to questioning herself, to changing her faith completely, to going back to belief and faith in herself. It's yeah, she gets, well, it's, yeah, that was, and also that was a really, we were tr going back to finding the temperature of it. It was tricky because that scene can easily become okay, Joan against all these men. But what was more interesting, I think, for us to discover is that's already going to be kind of what's painted because of what happens, but what are the other colors of it? Because actually, what we end up doing is it actually becomes more about Joan trying to connect with all of them. Well, and them trying to save her in right. their minds. Yeah. So instead of it being, okay, me just against you, it's actually we're both trying to save each other, and then it just doesn't quite work out that way, <laughs> to say the least. Um, well, the Inquisitor kind of gives up and it's like, yeah, burner, I'm bored. <laughs> I can't deal with this anymore. Um, but it's, um, it is challenging, but, and also, um, it's funny, someone else asked me about that scene the other day and asked like, what was going through my mind, and I don't really have an answer because it, it cut, yeah, it, it's one of those scenes where you, we just, and even in rehearsals, I remember like when we started rehearsing, we, we never did that scene halfway. We've always done that scene full out, it seems. Even when we were reading it at the table, that scene is always just, because it's such a, just, it's such a raw, real scene, all we have to do is lend ourselves to what's there. And I would imagine, I'm not an actor, but I'd imagine that you rehearse that scene to that point so that when you finally get to performance, everything can kind of go red and you can, through memory, go through all the emotional places that you need to go through on stage without having to be like, what's in my head right now? How well, do I yes, get Well, yes, but here? then we get surprised because actually what was going, what was really happening at the beginning of our run right now is it's now it's something different. Really? Yeah. Every, every day we do it, it's like, okay, oh, it's this, oh, I didn't know about that door in this house. This is a whole other room. How, how so? Do you want to? It's so interesting to listen to. I'm not in that scene, so I only hear it on the squawk box. But every night it varies in many, many ways. So it's not, it's... I think that, that might be a misunderstanding that people have about acting in general is they think that we kind of set something, decide what we're going to do, and then repeat it from night to night. When in fact, it's much more like playing tennis. And if I were to decide I'm going to go out in a tennis match and only do my backhand um, that day uh, for the first three strokes and only my forehand for the next, you know, I'd be a pretty poor tennis player. I have to be looking to see where Condole is, try to approach her in a way that will um, get what I want from her, and then that changes what she does, and what, then that changes what I do, and then that changes what, some, what Walter Bobby does, and, and it goes around the table like that. And I think that that's just something that the theater has to offer that you don't get to see on screen. On the screen, you see the one take that the director chose, or the bits of, of many takes that the director chose. But on stage, it's live. And if you come and see Joan on Tuesday night, it'll be different than if you see it on Thursday night or Friday night. And in this case, also, we have the joy on many nights of the audience becoming vocally involved. Yeah, and when, really involved. and sometimes they cheer her when she tells us off. And sometimes they, um, 
sometimes they they'll they're really against me. Sometimes they get very um, very very quiet, um, in a way that's a, a kind of palpable silence that's very satisfying. Um, so that's been really great in that scene because we have, um, unfortunately, we don't have John Glover in that scene, but we have virtually the whole cast in that scene, and. Um, and so we all get to have that experience every night, and that's great, uh, great, great fun. I, fun is probably not the best word for no, you, but but it, actually, no, but but it actually, is. It is yeah. though. It is. It is fun. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. It's a weird word to use, but it actually is fun getting to play with such a large group of people on stage like that. Well, and most actors who like their job generally, when they you see them do something that looks like it requires a fair amount of stamina, and you ask them if that was exhausting, they're like, "No, that was thrilling. Yeah. I loved doing it. Maybe I slept pretty hard that night, but I don't walk off the stage tired. I walk off thrilled." And what you don't know is that we all, all those people sitting around with no lines, they're all like A plus actors. Yeah who are the understudying these roles, and because Dan is the director, he is, he's gotten these superb actors to sit around the table. So the silent energy we're getting from these people, they're not just supernumeraries sitting there, they're playing into the scene. Uh, you know, at the, at the uh, risk of going scene by scene with what I love from this play, I do want to talk about the final scene. I, think, I believe it's the final scene of the play, where it just becomes an almost like slapstick satire out of nowhere. It's a theatrical experience. That's what, yeah. that's what we described it in, in rehearsal, because we were all trying to figure out, like, what is this? And we decided it's, it's a meta-theatrical experience. I loved it so much. You're watching this historical drama that, yes, has good punchlines and can be funny at times, that just suddenly switches gears completely at the end to be a, a comical commentary on itself and on history. So yeah, what was it like for you guys in rehearsal to, to uh, just go from this to that completely different tone? Right, I think in the beginning we, because of, because of where the rest of the play uh, sits in our bodies, I think we attacked that scene at first with the same kind of energy and it didn't work because we were trying to make too much sense, like we were trying to make it too pedestrian and, and we had to just let go and allow it to be this meta theatrical experience. Um, and For those that don't know, excuse me, it's like after Joan is burned at the stake, uh, we then sort of, the next scene is the, is the king in the midst of a dream and all of the ghosts from the experience of, of, of Joan are visiting him and visiting Joan and having a conversation about the play <laughs> that you just watched. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all laying in bed together. <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, but once we kind of let that go and, and let go of trying to, you know, because at first I was like, well, okay, so she's been burned, so so like, where, what do I want? What, what does she want? And I'm like, no, no, I don't have to think about all that. It's just, just, just be there, just be present. What are the lines? Go with the lines and just trust it. And once we just trusted it, it just took shape. But I'm so happy that he didn't cut it because I think from what I've heard in a lot of productions, they often cut that scene. Really? Yeah, and they end it with, um, uh, it's so sad. That I know, feels like a, I know. A pr like productions that would just wouldn't understand. Oh, that's it, so it, sad. It's necessary. The thing is, is that like if you cut it, you you end with um, Warwick with the heart being like, "Have we heard the last of her? I wonder." And that's the way it ends, which is a very like. It's a completely different play <laughs> yeah, in my right. mind. Yeah. But this this what this does, and for me anyway, which is what I love about it, is it provides this space. Outside of just what actually happens in the play, it, it provides this space where you can look at it as a human story. And you see all these humans that have kind of maybe been against each other in the play. And you see them all together. And them all having this very honest conversation about how they all thought they were doing the right thing. And that, to me, is such a large human message of maybe taking the time to look when someone is thinking that they're doing the right thing and like what does that do you know because i think it's very easy for us to paint villains often and uh, yeah, sometimes it's very easy Which, and that goes back to how, what you said about the, the the what he prefaced the play with that there are no yeah. villains in this play so having that moment is very it, it i think it allow it what, what am i trying to say i feel like it invites the audience to question and to think um because when you have always made up your mind, okay, this is the good, this is the bad, you often don't question and you don't listen anymore because you've decided that's bad, so I don't want to know anything about it, and that's good, so this is all I want to know. But if you can put a different lens on it, it just provides a different space for you to be able to question. 
and to invest. I feel like stylistically too, it's Shaw. Uh, it, it, it goes along with the theme of the play, which is the theme of the play is think for yourselves. Yeah. Don't let these big and 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 stylistically, it's a it's a jump for the audience to make at the end to go from this tragedy of this teenager being burned at the stake to what it, this this really um, kind of a romp, a comic scene. And it requires the audience to make a kind of stylistic leap that a lot of playwrights don't require of them. Nowadays, all kinds of playwrights have started writing that kind of magic realism. But um, when he wrote it, and even now, I think it, I think it angers some people. They don't, they don't want to go there. They just uh, they want to walk out with the feeling they had and the fact that Shaw is uh, when when the feeling they had when she was burned and and when Shaw requires that they take a step further into her sainthood and into these other questions it makes some people angry and it makes some people some people is by far their favorite part of the play it's really it's really interesting how modern the playwriting is there. Well, tr- Comedy is human, and I think comedy oftentimes represents humanity's best, and sometimes it's worse. And to end a tragedy with so much comedy is such a masterful sort of stroke by a very wise playwright. And to cut it off, whoever did that, I'd like to talk to them because I do not think I think that's such a, a, a sad move and something that really misunderstands what he's going for with the whole the whole show. Because I think especially with this, you guys get the comedy so well in all of the scenes. Like Joan can be very funny at times. She's really. F- <laughs> when I read the play, I the first thing I thought was, oh, she's not only is she, but the play's. F- I mean, it's yeah. it's pretty funny, and she's pretty funny. I mean, there's. I think it's you know she's not trying to be funny, but it it is funny to have this seventeen year old be so sure of herself and and basically like her whole vibe throughout the play is like, no, I get that you don't understand what I'm doing, but this is what's happening. So you're gonna get on board in five, four, three, two, and you're on Thank board. You. Got it next. So it's like it's funny, you know. Yeah. And she's and and again, um, what we were saying before, there's a level of innocence to her, and there was. This is also based on the research. She was not traditionally educated. Um, she was not herself a politician. She didn't have the training for that. She just knew what it is that she was supposed to do. Now she didn't maybe realize that what it is that she was going to do was going to stir up all of these politics. So she kind of got lost in the whirlwind of what it is that her actions were and didn't quite know how to temper all these other things around her. So to me, there, there, is, a, there is a little bit of, a, of humor in there where this, all these crazy things are happening and she's a little bit like, I, don't, I mean, I don't know. All I know is we have to go to battle tomorrow. So, okay, I'm just going to let you guys work the rest of it out. But Well, there is something <laughs> about what you do with your eyes, whether intentionally or not, that presents her age and naivety at times. As much as she is probably stronger and smarter than everybody else, there is still something naive in her eyes that you're presenting in every scene, I think especially in, in like the trial, which uh, I, I just thought was really beautiful and Thank a you. very good, smart way to do it. Thank you. Uh, let's have some questions from our audience. Hi, um, I was wondering about the costumes. Uh, how comfortable were they, and did they ha- did they help to get into character at all? Let John answer that one because you've got the biggest costume, really. Of- no, they I mean they wear metal metal armor. The oh, guys, so I'm, I'm in a sort of a archbishop gown robe. <laughs> it was very intimidating for me at first, and my miter, which is mighty miter, uh, was was uh, I ended up wearing somebody else's miter who wasn't quite as powerful because I thought mine was too big. <laughs> so I rejected it and got a smaller miter. <laughs> but I've learned to whip those gowns around like, like you know, dames do as they, as they play in the trick thing because we were first tripping over old men. Yeah. Yeah. Tricky. When They're not uncomfortable like the soldiers. Though. When Dan first... Uh, asked me if I would be in the show. Then my agent called me and said, hey, hey why don't you be in the show, but um, also that he wants to do something, he wants to do kind of a Harvey Weinstein moment with Joan at the beginning, so he wants you in the bathtub and he, th- and will you mind, would you mind being naked? And I said, um, I, whatever, I want the part, um, so I'm sure he'll light it tastefully or whatever. And Dan, it turns out I'm not naked in the first scene. I'm like wearing tights with my shirt off, but which is comfortable to answer your question. But um, because Dan couldn't figure out how to get the bathtub on and off stage. <laughs> so, so I ended up being able to have tights and you were spared the moment of coming in and seeing me. Naked. That's good to know. Are bathtubs um, hard to get on and off stage? 
I think so. A bathtub yeah. full of water, yeah. yeah. Because yeah. Apparently, I think they thought they were going to bring it up and down on the trap, but then they found out the bed had to be below on the trap, and there wasn't room for both the bed and the bathtub, and it was going to slow down the whole... And then I think Dan also thought to begin to began to think better of the idea of having me be naked in the first scene, <laughs> which I'm grateful for. Um, the armor was a whole other level <laughs> because we knew we were going to be wearing armor, but in rehearsal, we didn't have it. So I feel like the scenes that we didn't have it in the rehearsal room, we were kind of, we were kind of, you know, flitting through that room and <laughs> moving around in such a way. And then we got, when we got to uh, tech with her, so I was like, oh, okay, okay. So I can't move my arm like that. All right. <laughs> Let me just recalibrate. Um, but we, but, it, but it, it helped actually, because there were certain scenes that I feel once we got the armor, it weighted us in the scene. Whereas before I might've been moving around too much. And then all of a sudden when I couldn't, it made it more about the connection between I think it's the scene three with me and Daniel Sunjata. He has the most armor on. And then I come in with all these plates on. But before, we were kind of, we had all this choreography. <laughs> and then we kind of realized, like, oh, that that's, doesn't actually help the scene. And it makes it a, a much weightier scene to just have it be simpler. And the armor kind of made that decision for us. Next question. Hi, everyone. Thank Hi. you so much for being here today. My question is for you. I wanted to know um, what your personal process was for getting into the mind of a character like Joan, and what was the most difficult part, and how did you kind of work through that? Uh, well, to go back, basically, I found out that I was going to be doing this in last August. I was uh, August, July. I was doing a Doll's House Part Two when I found out that I was going to be doing this. So what I did was it's an incredible play. By oh, the way, Doll's cool. House. Oh, yeah, Lucas Nath is an amazing playwright. Um, but as I said before, like what I really how I got into it was my research for Joan. That is that was my way into this character. So starting in October, I for about two months I actually put the play completely aside. And I researched Joan as if I were writing a thesis on her. And even right now, my entire, I have one room where my entire room literally looks like I'm, I'm creating a thesis on this person. Um, and so I thought that that was gonna be, I thought that that was gonna be tricky because that's so much information to, 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 to um, upload. But once I started to get into it, the story of Joan herself is, nothing less than amazing. Like if you, if you ever go and, and just look at what is there, like what the, what the facts are, what we actually have. It, once I started, I was like, is this a screenplay? What, this is, okay, so this is all factual. Okay, so, that ha okay, so that's documented. Okay, so it's, once I got into that, it, it, there was something that was taking off my plate where I didn't feel like I had to, I almost felt like I didn't have to stress too much. It was just about following the truth of who this person was. And when I started to do that, it, it all just started to, I don't, I don't, it's hard to describe, but it just kind of all unfolded. And then I got into the room with this ridiculously talented cast. And from day one, I was like, okay, so this is just unfolding. All I have to do is make sure my whole channel is very clear, <laughs> stay focused and give everything that I have. But we're support, there was a weird feeling where I just felt like, okay, we're supported in this. We're supported in this. Everybody that's at this table is supposed to be at this table. And all we have to do is lend ourselves to it and it will be exactly what it's supposed to be. And that's what happened. It's a testament to a sort of a great, a great playwright and a, a great, great play a lot of the great time. Great director, great yeah. cast. But also, if I can say, at the risk of embarrassing Condola, she was not just, she wasn't just playing Joan, she was also leading the company um, in a way that was very inspiring and made you want to meet that challenge, the months of preparation that she had done. Uh, so that if, the, if we had a historical question, very frequently you'll have a dramaturg in the room who's done all the historical research. Well, this was our dramaturg. So that was very inspiring for us to say, okay, we're, we want to step up to that level, you know. I think I have time for one more. Hi. Um, I was wondering, how, how do you do this show every day? And, like, without it getting 
boring and like how avoiding it becoming second nature and something simple that like is a normal repetitive thing? Like how do you keep it fresh every night? Well, I think that's a question mostly. I, I mean, hers has to be a an emotional survival job, <laughs> right? I mean, for me, it's super easy. I don't know how it is for you. Um, for me, it's just about making sure I'm I'm really responding to what she's doing, and then if I am, but well, it's not going to be the same as last night. Mm -hmm. It might be close to last night, or it might be radically different. I don't know, and I have to risk that maybe what will happen will be wrong. But you know what? When you really risk it, it's not wrong very often. Yeah. You know. Uh, I always say in my journey when I've been in productions has always been okay. We start a production and it's new and it's fresh, and then like there's a there's always, in the past there has been a place where I reached this point where I'm like okay. I gotta find something new. I'm hitting a wall and I don't ever wanna feel like I'm phoning it in because that's just, that's, that's not a good feeling as an actor when you feel like, okay, I just, just autopilot. So that happens and then you get a little like, oh God, I don't know. And then something happens where you reach a new door and all of a sudden you, the door opens and you're in an entirely different room. And then for a couple of weeks, you're like, oh, the play is entirely different. Then you reach another moment. And then so it just continued, these doors just continue to open. This play in particular, uh, okay, the whole, one of the things that I noticed when, when we first opened was, oh, so in my career, this is the first time where I've literally had to be physically present on stage for this long, this amount of time. And I've been in other, even with Romeo and Juliet, which I did a few years ago, it was a substantially large role, but the stage time itself was not the same. I come on and come off and come on, come on, which allows the brain or your mind to have a break. And then you come back. On. But this, I was like, oh, I have to, the focus level is so real because as someone who can sometimes get a little um, distract, easily <laughs> distracted, it takes a lot of breathing and connecting because not one second can drop and I'm there for most of it. But what that there's something about that experience that allows it to be different because you ha like you you have to stay on it you have to stay present um, because if you don't then you, it will fall off um, so breathing really is the answer for me but there's also the architecture too that Dan that the playwright has set up but Dan also in rehearsal was giving us a kind of an architecture of of a free form but of, of the structure of how the, the scenes work. So that basis was so strongly given to us and we worked all on it together. I mean, he included us all the time asking questions. So it was up for everybody to, to talk and to decide different things. But within that come the changes every night that make it much easier to, to play, I think, honestly, because of this basic architecture that sometimes gets left out of a production. Yeah. But Dan's a genius, a master at what he does. And well, I think, as are you guys, because it's a beautiful play and everything comes together wonderfully in it. Congratulations. It's up for two more weeks, right? At the yeah. Samuel J. Friedman Theater. People go see it, get tickets. I don't know how many are available, but <laughs> go and see the play. It's really something else. It's incredibly beautiful. And good luck Thanks. with your nomination. And thank you so much for being here, you guys. Give them a round of applause. Yeah.